Ryan, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I'm excited to dive into your journey, how you've been able to create uh, life freedom, how you've built multiple businesses, how you've built wealth at a young age, and all these incredible things. But first, I want people to understand your character. I met you through a guy named Chuck Balsamo. Anybody who listens to the show knows Chuck, uh, as he's been on five times, which is way more than anybody else. <laughs> um, but you are obviously somebody who's connected with Chuck, and therefore I was like, I need to know you. Uh, and we we connected however many months ago and started talking about real estate because it's something that obviously my wife and I are jumping into. Um, but I want to get into, I want you to share with my audience, who is Ryan today? And sure. then we will break down how you got there because it's quite the journey. Yeah, no, good, good question, man. Um, I think for me, my area of expertise has really been on like real estate marketing. Um, you know, I, I've always been a fan of eat what you kill, like trading dollars for time. My last year as a W2 employee, I made like 23 grand pre-tax, like Just broke, broke. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I need, I need something where I can get paid off of what I'm able to generate or the opportunities that I'm creating. Um, so I guess, you know, who I am today, uh, own a direct mail business called ballpoint marketing, primarily in the investor and realtor space, got a call center named call Porter. We take 20,000 inbound calls a month for people in real estate all around the country. Um, we're franchising what I do through something called sold fast. Uh, we're currently in like the fractional beta stage with five markets there. Um, and then I also run a, a real estate consulting company called CCF. So we teach like mom and pop folks that are already established how to go find their own deals. Um, I'm a big believer in like, I don't want to sell the dream. I want to help people that already have it. The whole like 997 to the 3K weekend to the, you know, 30K, like that's just always been gross to me because I've. <laughs> I've been on the other end of that of like, well, no, give me what I really want just out, out the gate. So um, I've always kind of just set out to be the resource that I was looking for when I first started out and kind of giving that out for free. And then if folks want to work with us directly, you know, sure. Happy to do that. Yeah. Which obviously if anybody follows you on Instagram, that's listening to this, it, you, you literally just give it all away. There's no, there's no hook. There's no, Oh, Hey, if you want more, go click that link in my bio. You're just dumping the knowledge. So let's talk a little bit about your journey. Obviously, sure. going from $23,000 a year to hopping into real estate. Most people go, well, I only make $23,000 a year. I can't hop into real estate. Like, what yeah. was that like? What was that big leap and why real estate? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm a car guy. I'll just be blunt. <laughs> so You can also uh, see that on your Instagram as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, I could recite zero to 60 and horsepower specs of like anything that was current at the time as a kid. And I was working at a call center. I didn't graduate high school. Uh, I had my first full-time job at 17. And um, I remember Googling, how do people afford Lamborghinis, right? Like clearly what I'm doing is not it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I found a blog post by a gentleman named Mark Ferguson of Invest for More. Great dude, super legit operator, author, all that good stuff. And it was how he bought his Lamborghini Diablo through flipping houses. And I was like, interesting. So I think like everybody in real estate, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, probably the best lead magnet of all time that actually teaches you nothing. Uh, I, I got done with it and I was like, cool, I'm really excited. I don't know what to do with this. Yeah, I think I was yeah. supposed to go hire them for coaching. That wasn't what I did. Um, I found a website called biggerpockets.com and just kind of threw myself into the forums. You can find dumb 20 year old Ryan's like, I have no money, but I, I've got a credit card. What do I do type? type questions. Uh, so I started out wholesaling, which was effectively find a deal, uh, get it under contract, turn around and find somebody else to buy it. Uh, we actually don't wholesale anymore. I think there's a lot of room for like abuse just in that, in that system. It can get pretty sketchy, pretty gross. I, I yeah. joke that a lot of people I know that wholesale used to sell drugs and that, uh, <laughs> that, that translates pretty well. Um, so I put three grand, uh, I couldn't afford to spend on a credit card. I didn't tell my wife about it. And I dropped like 2,500 pieces of mail to homeowners, kind of a, Hey, I'm looking to buy a house in the area. Call me if you want to sell. I uh, got a property under contract, did everything wrong, but found somebody to buy it. Long story short, the, the chunk there in the middle uh, was like 12,500 bucks. So after paying back my marketing, I was left at like 10 K 
Uh, I had a business partner at the time was another coworker of mine. We were both like, Hey, this sucks. Let's try something different. And uh, I remember bringing that check home and being like, babe, this actually worked. And, and looking at like literally six months of my life that realistically took us like four hours to generate. And that was kind of the light bulb. Aha. Like, okay. You know, maybe there is a better path than taking phone calls for somebody else. Yeah, no. The, and that's such a, a fascinating thing. How old were you at the time? Cause I know you're fairly young. I would have been so 24, 14, I would have been 21, 22. Yeah. So super young, taking a, a risk in a gamble to say, let me, let me try something different. I couldn't imagine at that age, if somebody just handed me a $10,000 check, I'd be like, oh no. my God, like, this is, <laughs> no. it's like Pandora's box, right? Like yeah. there's now so much opportunity for me to, to do this time and time again. Now, is that mainly how you built your starting wealth you were just wholesaling for, and for how long because you said okay we don't do it anymore because it seems dirty so you were dirty for yeah. how long is what i'm asking <laughs> <laughs> so it's only dirty if you're not honest so like where i run into the ethical issue for me is pretending i have money to buy your house if i actually don't right so i run into issues people go under contract say they're going to buy the house can't find somebody to buy it they pull out tell the seller hey sucks to suck um, you know, I was dirty for probably six months before I got to the point that I was bankable and could buy it if I needed to. And that yeah. was actually how we got our first two rentals, uh, two places under contract. We're trying to wholesale and wasn't going great. Coworker and I were like, let's just keep them. Went to a local community bank, did a portfolio loan. We put 25% down, which we'd gotten from wholesaling a couple of other places. Um, so, you know, uh, wasn't really how I got most of my starting cash though. So I started out wholesaling. Uh, I moved to Indianapolis in 2016. So I did it kind of like for two years as like a side hustle. I was an insufferable employee. Just like, why would I take your phone call when my phone's ringing? And fortunately my manager was cool that he was like, bro, I wouldn't take our calls either. <laughs> like go on break. <laughs> right. Uh, so that was, that was helpful. Uh, shout out to Joe Yancey. If you happen to hear this and uh, you know, may the person who hired you to hire me not hear this. Um, 2016, I went full-time and was still trying to do it. We moved to Indianapolis, my wife's wife's grad school. Uh, that year was brutal. Uh, I, I was probably making 3000 bucks a house. It was costing me 3000 bucks to find a house at the end of the year. I was 36 grand in credit card debt. And I was like, this ain't working. That was actually when I hired Chuck, uh, called my wife. Uh, and I was like, I need help. <laughs> like, I don't know what kind, but I've got like, spiritual and business and life. Like I need somebody I can bounce stuff, stuff off of. Uh, 2017 was where stuff really changed for me. So 2016, I did six deals, barely made it. I, I don't think I even made money. Uh, 2017, I did 74 and Whoa. I started, yeah, big change. Um, I started doing what's called reverse wholesaling. So I found good, solid operators that didn't want to find their own inventory and I did all the front end marketing. I'd go do the marketing. I'd talk to the sellers. I knew what they were looking for. I'd take pictures. I'd bring that back to somebody like me now and say, hey, what would you pay for this place? And try to build in some margin for myself. Um, 2017, I probably made right under 400, would be my guess. Um, that was the first like, wow, we're really having fun. Like debt-free, yeah. cash in the bank. Um, and then what I started to notice is people were doing what was called wholetailing with my deals. So I'd find the deal. They'd tell me what they wanted to pay. I'd go back and negotiate a deal with some spread for myself. They would take that same house, clean it out, do nothing to it, take good pictures, throw it on the market. And they'd make like 40 K and I'm like, mm -hmm. wait a minute, your part's not that hard. And <laughs> I, I have money now and connections now, like, so I started then doing that. So um, that's really what we're a big fan of now of like, I'm either going to wholetail the place, get it on market, get it out there. Uh, I'm going to retail it like full on flip, make it ready for a homeowner, or we're going to keep it. What I've found is if you find the deal, the likelihood that the, the two or three people I know or the hundred people that are on my list that are looking for deals is going to be the person who's going to pay the most is probably pretty low. Yeah. Some realtor has somebody out there that will pay way too much for it. Um, and you know, 
I'm, I'm happy to provide. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think that's kind of business one-on-one though, right? Like get your product in front of as many people as possible. For sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we see it here. And I think when, when you and I first connected, I was saying to you, I was like, yeah, we rent the house that we live in now because it fits us perfectly and we can't find the right house. that's not outrageously priced. Like everybody's yep. paying stupid prices for houses across yep. the board. And, and, you know, you essentially teach people how to live the American dream, right? Have the house, have the money, have the life. Like what's the drive? Obviously, look, you, you make money while teaching these things, but like, what's the true driving force to you? Was it your, sure. your aha moment of in 2017 where you're like, Oh my gosh, like this, this is real freedom. This is fun. Like, is that your, your driving factor? Um, so you, you kind of hinted at something we haven't talked about yet. So I've got a like project called hacking the American dream. So for anybody who's listening to this, and you're like, oh, it's guys like this. They're why I can't buy a house. No, I teach people like you how to do this for free. So if you're looking to get a home for your family, like I have like six plus hours of content plus a community all around you going off market direct to other owners to buy the place for your family. I've got results in like the Bay Area, Long Island, New York. If you're in like a cheap Midwestern market, this is stupid simple for me to get you a 10, 15, 20, 25% discount. Um, what started that for me was like done enough deals, made enough money. Uh, we didn't even start tracking like results of our clients. We started coaching in 2019. We didn't start tracking results until September, 2021. So it hasn't even been three years yet of tracking results and our investor clients have reported back to us over $78 million in profit. So that's equity wow. in new rentals. That's net from title on flips and wholesale fees. So like top line revenue, if you will. Um, I got to the point though, that it was like, what do I care about doing another deal? <laughs> like it, yeah, that no longer really fired me up. Um, making another one of our guys a millionaire, like we stopped counting them. Mm. Um, what fired me up though, is one of my clients reached out. I uh, weren't actually weren't even a client. It was somebody that followed me on YouTube and they were like, Hey, I tried what you do like for my family. And like, I got a $600,000 house for 400 K. And I was like, Oh, that feels good. That yeah. feels like it has, almost like some eternal weight into it, getting a family into a home. That's now an asset. You and I talked about this a little bit offline. Like my goal with anything I own or anything I'm into blessings can very easily become burdens. I learned if you don't have margin in them. So I'm a car guy. Uh, if I've got a fun toy, I should be able to dump it tomorrow for cash. Uh, my wife drives like a $135,000 Audi RS Q8. She barely drives it, loves it. I don't think I'll ever be able to get her out of it. Mm -hmm. I more bought it because I wanted to drive it. But like we put so much down on it in cash that if we ever needed to, we could go into any dealership and rip a check for 60, 70 K, right? Um, obviously you're going to lose money on a car. That's not an asset unless yeah, you're doing the whole life. Unfortunately, that's deal. how cars work. You drive it off yeah. a lot, you lose money. Right. But for like the typical person, if you go buy a house and you pay retail for that house, you're going to have anywhere from four to 10% in selling costs. If you decide you want to sell it. So you're like upside down from day one Yeah. versus if we can get you a 10 or 15 or 20% discount and you decide, Hey, this house is no longer working for me. You can turn around and sell it and <clears throat> actually get paid. Like that to me is, is super appealing. Um, driving factor for me, man, though, I think overall, um, I've always wanted to fund the causes I care about, spend time with who I want to spend time with when, drive whatever I want and do good business with good people. Like we're, we're very careful of who we teach and who we empower. Like if you're a sleazeball, I'm not going to help you be a better sleazeball. <laughs> like it's just, yeah. I, I don't need your money. Yeah. And from that standpoint, I love, I love that about you because that's my whole thing is like, so even my mastermind of, you know, six and seven figure entrepreneurs, the number one rule is give more than you take. Right. I've told yep. countless people, no, you're not, you know, this isn't for you. Like yep. people want to join. And I'm like, yeah, it's not, it's not your space. Like I think protecting your space, um, you know, and making sure that you're helping good people versus just helping people to get paid. Like that's such yep. a massive 
thing that people don't understand, right? Like to be able to put your head on the pillow at night and be like, I did good, right? I yeah. did good by myself and I did good by my, you know, in the world and all that fun stuff. So I love that dude. So you talk about being a car guy. You've mentioned it multiple times. What toy are you most excited about right now that you have? And how often are you flipping these cars over? Um, yeah, so I was churning through them quicker. Uh, currently I've got a, uh, it's called the BAC mono. It's like a single seat center position, street legal ish race car. That's really my current one. Um, I've got that. I've got a lucid. The wife's got the RSQ eight. I had a McLaren 720. I just sold, uh, I've got a BMW sport bike. Um, uh, I'm in an interesting position with the house. I just bought that. It only has a two car garage. I'm on like two and a half acres. So I'm building another garage, but I'm in California. So that process is like, not going to take, you know, four months. It's going to take like, I think we were told eight months just for permitting. <laughs> it's like before we could even break ground. Um, so I'm currently in like a, I can't really buy something else fun yet unless I want to store it somewhere else. Um, I'm probably going to buy a Raptor R this year. And, uh, my next like car that I want, I'm at the, like, I want to buy stuff. I'm going to keep forever. I want to buy like a 0506 Ford GT. Um, I feel like that's just one of those, like, if you're a dude and you're into cars, like that's one of those just like iconic, um, ones. So I think that's probably the next, like quote unquote, you know, exotic I buy. Um, but yeah, I'm currently hampered by, by only having interior storage for two first world problems, Ryan. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Very, very much. So, <laughs> although I, I think it's fascinating that, you know, somebody who is in real estate who had, you know, at one point, how many rentals did you have? Uh, we were up to like 150 units. Yeah. So 150 doors, you know, you, you know, why California? Because we look oh, at all the question. restrictions that are happening, you know, across yeah. the board, right? So, like I, we were saying before I hit record, like Pennsylvania is pretty lenient about many things compared to California. So, what yeah. made you decide California when you are that real estate guy? Um, so, one, I'm not investing here. Um, so, I grew up in the Midwest. I was actually I was in Florida. I was getting ready to move back to St. Louis. And I looked at my wife. I was like, I just can't do it. <laughs> like. We have family there. We have companies there. I want a property there. The way I have an excuse to be there more often, but I I'm very much influenced by my environment. Like I I paraglide is a big hobby of mine. This is like one of the best places in the world for it. I've actually got an incredible mountain site like 20 minutes from my house, uh, just like ri ridiculous. So I wanted to live somewhere that I didn't feel the need to vacation from. Yeah. So that when I was vacationing, it was less of an escape and more of a let's go see family or friends or let's go explore a different culture or something. Not like, gosh, I got to get out of here. The weather sucks. Yeah, that, um, no, that makes sense. And uh, my wife's a Navy psychologist. So I've a lot of guys, it's like, you know, I feel like their spouse kind of follows them. Ours has been a little bit different. Like I started investing in Indianapolis because that's where she went to grad school. Uh, we came to California for a year, then they sent us to Florida for three. So I did some investing while I was in Florida. Um, and then they offered to send us back here and we were like, yeah, sweet. So, uh, we are planning on staying though and putting down roots here. Yeah. So the, you know, we're obviously we're talking about real estate here and, and the one thing I'm learning as, you know, I'm a noob in this space and learning and navigating, but trying to understand it, even though we want to be hands off with what we're doing, I, I do want to understand it. There's, yep. I've learned that there are so many different avenues to make money in real estate, right? We talked about wholesaling or what are you calling it? Wholetailing? Yeah. So wholesaling is like you effectively pretend you're the buyer and you try to find somebody to buy it for more. Wholetailing is I literally buy the house. I clean it out. I maybe I fix a couple major things. So it's financeable. Like maybe I throw a roof on it, but I'm effectively selling it to somebody as like a handyman special. It needs some work. It needs some TLC kind of a thing. Yeah. But you were able to work a deal on the lower end. Like you said that you, you've, yep. you've learned the skill of ne negotiating 15, 20% less. No. <laughs> so, uh, so in our franchise sold fast, right? That's yep. the, 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 the reason I'm doing that. Um, is full transparency, no pressure, no haggling. I actually hate negotiating, like can't stand it. it makes my skin crawl. 
Um, I, I think that's something about like the Midwestern people pleasing confrontation avoidance, <laughs> right? Aspect. Uh, I literally tell sellers, this is what your house is worth on the market if you do nothing to it. This is what it's worth if you do some work to it. Here's what I think that work will cost. And here's what my cash offer is. So that's the whole thing with sold fast, like cash as is and fixed up. The thing that feels great to me with that, they're fully informed. Uh, and we're pulling in a licensed agent that's giving them those figures. So there's no... Um, I'm not incentivized to maybe fudge some things to make myself more money. Um, I'm doing a deal right now with one of our franchisees that the seller called in. Um, it was a house that had some land with it. And we said, hey, if you get this through entitlement, if you split the lot off, you can get 350 plus every day. Our cash offer is going to be like 175 because we don't know that we can get that done. That's kind of what we could get for the house. And they said, okay, let's put it on the market. Let's go through the process. Let's get 350 for it. Sweet. Halfway through the process, they came back and they said, actually, will you just give us 175? So let me be clear. You understand, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to finish getting this through entitlement that we've already started. And I'm going to list it for north of $350,000. But you would rather take the 175 and be done today. And they said, yep, absolutely. Don't want to go through the process. Wow. Our franchisee there will rip north of 100K with full transparency, fully educated, zero fraud, zero sketch. That feels way better to me than like strong arming somebody at the, we don't even make offers on the spot. It's literally over the phone the next day. And it's not a, which one are you taking? It's a, here's your options. We'd love to do business with you. Give me a call when you know which way you want to go. Wow. Yeah. And it's such, obviously it's such a great way to do it. Right. And obviously that that's appealing to me. Like I love yep. that style. I love the approach. I love doing all that stuff. So, you know, beyond that, there's a bunch of other ways, right? There's flipping, there's rentals, there's all yep. these things and you've done all of them. Like you've literally, you know, 150 units. How many houses have you flipped? Do you even know the number? Dude, I stopped counting. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, my business partner has counted them and it's like North of 300. That's crazy. So what yeah. do you feel is the the best way for somebody who's beginning to get into real estate? And then to follow up on that, what's the best way to to build wealth in real estate? Yeah, good question. Um, if you would have asked me this question three months ago, my answer would have been different. So as, as part of Sold Fast, we set up a retail brokerage in each market that we're in. And I'm realizing the conventional agent world is actually super easy. Like no, there's no risk to it. Hey, let me see if I can sell your house. If I can't, sorry. Right. Um, we've been cleaning up in that space on top of the franchise. So that's been really interesting to me. Um, it's less typically than the investor side, but it is, I think easier if you do it right. Um, there's a lot of fear and uncertainty and blood in the water in the conventional real estate world right now. Uh, I saw something that there was like one and a half million agents and less than one and a half million properties listed for sale. Yeah. Yeah. I, so, being, so it's, it, that's, I, that's crazy that that's national. I remember sitting down, this was years ago, sitting down with a realtor in my area. So in my County, he said there's like 300 real estate agents and currently there's 120 houses for sale. Yep. Wild. Yep. So if you can figure out finding deals and finding clients, honestly, like with the stuff we teach for free, I, I think you can print money in that area right now. Um, so there's, there's that, um, my typical recommendation for guys like me that like, you know, young, broke, hungry, more, more time and drive and hustle than cash. I still really like reverse wholesaling. Like you find somebody that's legit that you trust. They tell you what they want to pay. It's their proof of funds. It's their money. It's their reputation on the line. Like, I think that's also a good option. Um, but again, like you're only as legit as the person you're trusting. So yeah. um, that's my go-to recommendation for people that want to start in real estate investing. The conventional agent side, if you do direct to seller marketing is, is pretty solid. Um, as far as building wealth, so 
I'm a big fan of making a large sum of liquid money and then deploying it. Um, you know, I've got, I'll paint two pictures for you. Um, I know somebody that let's say they have a $30 million real estate portfolio that they have $25 million in debt on, right? Interest rates go up. Okay. Taxes go up. Ouch. Right. Um, I know people with portfolios like that, that aren't making any money right now. Wow. Flip side. I've got a buddy of mine in Indiana that owns 50 houses free and clear. That's hot. <laughs> like, yeah, that's crazy. You know, you, you, how do you lose on that? Right. And they're not in the hood. Now he, it took him 10, 15 years to get there. So I'm a big fan of like, make it in something and make it substantial. Like if you only have a hundred K, I'm not like, Oh, you should probably go buy a rental. I'm like, how do we turn that hundred K into 500 or into a million? Like, yeah. And that tends to be through the transactional stuff, right? Um, me personally, like if I'm placing capital, um, I'm looking to do that in two places. One would be an actual real estate fund. And the second would be things like self-storage, boat storage, RV, warehouse. Uh, none of that stuff's political. Like, hey man, you didn't pay the rent for the slot your trailer's in, so we're going to we're going to tow it to this tow yard, right? Yeah. Like there's no court hearing. Uh, there's no like tears with that. Like, hey, you didn't pay the bill on your storage unit. We're going to auction your stuff off. Yeah. Um, so, storage wars, man. I love that show. Yeah. By the way, totally. That stuff's totally planted. That's not even real. Yeah. Yeah. I'm calling it. I'm like, yeah. no, I, I 100% this, this agree. Heirloom owned by Elvis Presley just sitting in a storage unit. Like, okay. Yeah. Sorry. I had to say it. No, you're good. Um, so I would say that's more my thought, like make it in transactional stuff and then place it in the stuff that's more passive. Yeah, no, I do. And, and I love that approach. And I'm, I'm sure you and I are going to have many more conversations about that offline. So understand, like, I want people to, that are hearing this, understand that, like, you're somebody, although I, I have just met you in a sense, like, I feel like I, you're very trustworthy, right? There's too many people out there that are in it for how do I make how do I just constantly make money off of this stuff versus like, how do I actually yeah. help this person? Um, so I love that approach, man. So I want to ask you a question that I ask every single person on the show. It's a two part question. Sure. First part is what is your definition of success? And the second part is what are three things you do every single day to ensure that success for yourself? Mm, good question. Um, success for me, I think is, like financial and time freedom that I don't have to sell my soul or sacrifice my family to get. Um, you know, I, I tell people all the time, like, I don't feel bad about a dollar that I've made. I don't have a conscious time. I can recall where I lied to somebody about what their property was worth to then profit off of it. Um, I believe at the end of the day, like we're all accountable for our actions. And I want that to be a relatively pleasant conversation, right? I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. On the three things, you you hit me at an interesting time because for a while I was really good with being very consistent in aspects. And I've kind of slipped in some things and um, redoubled down on that. Like, okay, what really matters to me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I would say in that, like number one would be quality time with my wife and kid every single day. Um, you know, if I know a lot of very wealthy men that no longer have their families, uh, a, a buddy of mine put it well of like best case scenario, if you get divorced, some other dude that you maybe like has your kid half the time what kind of example are they, what kind of father are they? Right. Uh, so that's always sobering, like keeping that reality in mind. I don't know divorce statistics for guys like you and I, but I'm sure it's higher, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, second, I, I think um, every day I look for some practical way to live or love like Jesus would. And I'm, I'm very, um, I'm not your guy that has like Christian in the bio. Like I just, that tells me you're probably going to scam me. It's like immediately <laughs> where my cynical brain goes. Um, but there's a guy, Bob Goff, that has a book called Everybody Always. And it's like practical showing up for people. So 
Can I take in the neighbor's trash cans? Can I actually check in with the clerk at the, you know, store I'm getting groceries at, make them actually feel seen. Um, part of my, like one of my daily things, I try to check in with three friends of like, how are you really doing? Mm. Um, third thing I would say is I try to move things forward every single day. Uh, it's really easy for me to sit down at my desk, have conversations like this and not actually move the needle forward on anything. So, uh, I ask myself every week, I got this from a guy named Cody Jefferson, but what have I been putting off that I know I need to do? And what does it add to my values, to my life, to my business by addressing that this week? And when am I committed to getting that done this week? Um, I found that to be very helpful. Just like moving the needle forward. Yeah, dude. Uh, and, and I love all those things. And it's, it, it's so funny. Cause obviously for me, like I, I have four non-negotiables every single day, but it's an ebb and flow, right? Like certain days I lay down on the pillow and I'm like, you know what? I didn't check those off today. Like not every yeah. single day is perfect. But one of my things is I check in with one person in my, in my circle every day and say, Hey, yep. how are you? Like, what can I support you with? What's going on? Um, and that alone has changed my life exponentially. Very yeah. few days go by now that where somebody doesn't check on me just with a simple text, yep. right? So it's helped me from that standpoint, but it's, it's pushed forward all of my relationships. Like even the ones that don't need the text check-in, like yep. even my stepkids and even my wife, like it's, it's improved all that stuff. And so I love that you do that too. Now I, I feel like I have to step it up since you do three people a day. Uh, I don't know. This is up. a, this is the ebb and flow. I shoot for three, <laughs> but you know, on that note, man, like I had a, I had a really rough spot in uh, early 2023. And one of my buddies out of the blue just texted me and said, Hey, I just want you to know the world's better with you in it. And it was like, I needed that today. Yeah. That, that was not where my head was today, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, you're right. It, it's kind of that it's almost like what we, what we need by doing that for other people almost comes back full circle. Yeah. It's like, you know, obviously our, our mutual connection and Chuck, he's the person like my, my phone starts ringing and it's Chuck trying to FaceTime me at the most inopportune times where you're like, always. how do like, it's always <laughs> like, okay, like, why are we FaceTiming? Like, for, you're yeah. like, I, you know, it's that crazy thing, but I was in Philadelphia, uh, two weekends ago for WrestleMania. And I, I was there and I guess another guy that he knows was there. And so he does a three-way FaceTime. So first of all, I'm in my hotel room. And I get a FaceTime call from Chuck, but then there's this person on there that I have no idea who it is. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm answering this. He's like, yo, you're both at WrestleMania. You need to know each other. And then I ended up having breakfast with the guy the next day. And like, you know, I love connectors like him because, yeah. you know, otherwise we wouldn't be having this conversation. I wouldn't have had a great conversation over breakfast when I was in Philadelphia for WrestleMania. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, it's just a powerful thing. And so I think when you're checking in with those circles, you realize very, very quickly, you're like, okay, these guys need to know each other. If they don't, they should. And, and yeah. being able to do those types of things gives you the power to be able to, to change the world through those connections. So I have another question for you and I, and I want you to think about all the work that you've done, right? Like you've helped sure. countless people become millionaires. You've built massive wealth for yourself and you continue to do it time and time again, you've built multiple businesses, but I want you to think the last day of your life. You know, you're about to take your last breath and all that stuff does not exist. It gets wiped off the face of the planet and you could only be remembered for one sentence. What would you, what would you want that sentence to be? Hmm. Good question. I think it probably comes down to. practical impact I hope to make through my current son and eventual kids. Um, that really is the, like, I, I try to love my wife the most and them second, right? Mm -hmm. Or I guess God first, then my wife, then kids. Um, but it would have to be something to the effect of my role as like a father, protector and provider. I think that's, Anytime I'm looking for motivation, like there was one day I forgot to bring pre-workout to the gym. I was like, this sucks. I was like, okay, I'm going to envision that my kid's here watching me. Right. I love that. Yeah. Um, anytime I have somebody bring me something that sounds like it's got a little bit of sketch to it. Right. And I kind of sniff that out. I think, okay, you know, ultimately I'm going to be accountable for the decision I make here. Um, but 
I, I don't ever want to hear my kids say, well, I did this because I saw you do that. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it keeps you in check. Yeah. It allows you to live in integrity for sure. Yeah. I don't have uh, a good one liner sentence for you, but that general theme, I'd like it to be in that direction. We'll, we'll, we'll work on it and then we'll, we'll yeah. put it out in like a quote card or something, right? We'll, we'll figure out what that <laughs> sentence is. Um, no, dude, I love it. So I wrap up every single interview with the same question, but before we get there, let's get to the good stuff. How do people find you? How do they connect sure. with you? All that stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm absolutely the most active on Instagram. I'm the least active on Facebook. Um, and then if you're interested in more like the longer form, how to type content as a real estate investor, that all goes on YouTube for me. Um, if you're looking to like buy your own home and want like my free help with that, just DM me on Instagram. Um, I, I had like a sales page up for it. We tried charging for it, scaling it with ads. I refunded everybody. I was like, this just, I'd rather just give it away. Um, you can just DM me for that, or you can email me. Uh, it's just Ryan at Ryan .com. Love it, man. So like I said, I wrap up every single interview with the same question. Since the show is called the growth now movement, that question is in your life. What has been your biggest moment of growth? Biggest moment or biggest like decision. A decision is a moment. Okay. Um, I read a book when I was probably like 15, 16 called every young man's battle. Uh, it's primarily like anti-adult content, right? I'll choose your imagination, draw the conclusions of <laughs> what 16 year old Ryan needed help with. Um, but there's a, a thing in there. They talk about, uh, there's this lie culture tells us of one day you'll be a man one day you'll be successful right now. You're not. So it's okay to act childish or, you know, um, not show up because like that day is not, you're never going to wake up one day and be like, okay, it's, it's, I am now officially an adult. Um, <laughs> I'm still, I waiting. think that's, I think that's probably why my life is different than people that I grew up around or worked with, or, um, I mean, did I had my first full-time job at 17. I, I remember deciding like, okay, I'm an adult now, <laughs> you yeah. know, um, I think, I think it's probably that, uh, sister to that would be deciding I wasn't going to wait for other people to make my goals happen. I was going to make it happen myself. Um, I spent a lot of time waiting on people to bring me in on things, partner with me on things. And the big catalyst was like, no, my, my goals, the causes I care about, my family is too important to place that on somebody else and just hope they do it for me. Yeah. I love it, man. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom with my audience. Guys, make sure you go check them out. This conversation has been absolutely amazing, dude. I look forward to our friendship growing uh, and seeing how we can support each other going forward, dude. I appreciate you. Yeah, dude. Thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate you.